Our next speaker has been a, tuberculis, a tuberculosis TB clinician for more than 25 years and served as San Francisco's TB controller from 1996 to the end of 2011. She has done several researches and projects on interferon gamma release assay and gene expert in San Francisco, USA. She joined the Global Life Sciences Corporation, Kiagen, in 2012 as Senior Director of Scientific and Medical Affairs for TB Diagnostics. She is an international uh, speaker on tuberculosis and has co-authored and reviewed numerous TB publications. To talk on diagnosis and management strategies for latent TB in children, let us all welcome Dr. L. Masei Kawamura. Well, thank you very much. I flew almost around the world to, to get here. I'm really excited and I want to congratulate the National TB Program for uh, getting the TB law passed. This is really going to help children uh, with the reporting, mandatory reporting of cases. Uh, but my favorite part of the law is no spitting. <laughs> Uh, I, what I'm going to talk to you today is about management strategies for latent TB infection. All of you are the experts in infectious diseases, and, and for tuberculosis, you know there is no vaccine. Um, we have the BCG vaccine, but it really doesn't prevent infection, nor does it prevent disease. The only thing it does is reduce disseminated disease and death in children under the age of five by 75 percent. That's all it does. It's not changing the epidemiology. Before I start my talk, I have a disclaimer. I do work for Kyogen, the manufacturer of Quantiferon. Um, however, everything I'm about to say in these slides are my own um, and do not belong to the company, and it's based on my experience as a TB doctor and TB controller. First, I'd like to start off by telling you that ending TB in children means ending TB in adults. And we have, that's a very important fact. All of you need to advocate for the prevention and elimination of disease in, a, in adults because they get it from, from uh, the adults. And this is a, a nice example. This is a case of uh, one of my patients who had come in um, and, and was diagnosed with latent TB infection. She had a small little fibrosis. She was a 28-year-old mother from Central America. We prescribed uh, a preventive treatment, isoniazid, and she didn't take the medicine. She dropped out after uh, a couple of months. And she didn't follow up, although we attempted to, to contact her. And then two and a half years later, uh, or three years later, what happened? She started coughing. And, um, and when we found her, she had collapsed her right upper lobe. You can see that. And that's why it's white here. And our contact investigation revealed that her three-year-old uh, son had an infiltrate um, that turned out to be tuberculosis. The only, um, the only indication was that he had a positive TB test. So, this is a very good example where we failed to prevent TB in the mom and her little child who's under five, the most vulnerable to TB, by the way, you all know that, developed TB. And he was asymptomatic. So it's very difficult to d diagnose TB in children. But let's start off with the basic assumptions that uh, the risk of TB actually increases with the contact and to the type of contact whether the mother or father or uh, grandpa or grandmother in the household has mere positive TB or culture positive TB. And once our children get infected, there is a 50% chance uh, of progression in infants and 15% uh, chance of uh, progression in older children within two years of becoming infected. That's extremely high risk, okay? And that's something that should never happen in a child. Unfortunately, it happens too often. And so if you can prevent active TB in at least these children, it really does maximize the, the risk-benefit ratio. 
Um, this is a study done by Robert Horsbro in the United States and was published in the New England Journal uh, in 2004. And it shows that, um, that the incidence of TB, the risk benefit, the lifetime risk, really is highest in the first five years. Here's age on, on the x-axis. And it goes down, this is the golden age, between 5 and 13 or 14. And then you see a resurgence in adolescence. So it's really the youngest children and the adolescents, uh, and adolescents can spread TB, by the way, where they have the, the highest risk of um, disease progression and will benefit the most because they have such long lives. Okay. Now, uh, I, I looked in the internet and I found um, some guidance from your national TB program in the Manual of Procedures. Uh, and the current focus, and this is true for the WHO, is to only look at contacts after the, someone in the household was diagnosed with active TB. The contacts and really focusing on the child under age five. The Filipino guidelines are actually more expanded than that. The WHO guidelines in high burden countries, you find these kids, you make sure they don't have TB and you treat them. You just treat them without testing. Okay, all of them will get uh, uh, INH um, recommended. Okay, but these strategies, uh, just looking at context, are really limited, okay, because the implementation varies. Why? Because cases of TB aren't reported, and so the program never gets involved to do the contact investigation. And often when you find the children with TB, it's too late. You know, they already have ex uh, advanced disease, and it's hard to diagnose uh, TB in kids. You all know that, right? Um, but in the Filipino gui guidelines, which is more than the WHO, it's actually more complex. There are two different algorithms for children under age five, and then there's another algorithm for the children over age five. Uh, in the United States and most of the Western world, we just have one algorithm. We screen all the contacts in the house uh, children and adults, and we treat them all the same. And if they're infected, they get latent TB infection. Um, but because of resource constraints, here we go, with contacts under five, where, where you have a bacteriologically confirmed case, smear positive, gene expert positive, or culture positive, you do a TST. If it's negative, you still give uh, INH, at least you're getting a, a result here. If the TST is positive, you also give INH, okay, after active TB is ruled out. If the contact is under five, same group, and it's a clinically diagnosed case, meaning you don't have bacteriologic confirmation, they're not smear positive, they're not gene expert positive, often there's no culture, right, actually in adults. Then uh, you do a t skin test. If the skin test is negative, you don't give INH here. Um, and if the skin test is positive, then you give INH. So, you know, um, already it's, it's kind of complicated, right? And if your contact is over five, there's no testing at all. Uh, you do a chest X-ray and um, you just wait for symptoms to happen. Okay, remember they have, if they're infected, they actually have a high risk. And sh shouldn't their, their parents know? Shouldn't you know if you're their doctor? I'd like to argue with you. Okay, so if I could just dream and ex expand testing in children in the Philippines, I'm putting on my old TV controller hat, this is who I would target. I would target first and foremost the children that are subject to TB transmission. And who are they? Of course, they're the household contacts. Already you have guidance there, okay? Uh, and also, I would target children from hotspot communities, okay? And, and those children that are in congregate settings, okay? And when do, t uh, when do children get TB? Uh, it's really in the adolescent age, okay? So I would focus on junior high and high school, um, thalassemia transfusion centers, dialysis centers, um, it could be other kinds of schools, um, but all focusing on transmission. Now, if I switch to another group, this is very obvious, and I'm sure a lot of you already screen these kids for TB. 
it would be the group that has a high risk of disease progression. So these are the immunocompromised children that are steroids, biologic drugs, they're pre-transplant if, if they have kidney disease, or they suffer from chronic malnourishment. And the other, other group I would uh, focus on are children with medical risk, right? And, and we all know that the, the uh, immature immune system of the child less than five, those kids we really have to pay attention to, as well as kids who are on dialysis and children who have type 1 diabetes. Okay. But if resources are limited, then you want to prioritize the treatment, and not necessarily the screening, because I think every child, if you're the parent, you should know if your child's infected or not, because you want to look for symptoms. But if you can't treat them all, then you should focus the treatment on those with multiple risk factors um, and perhaps high quantifier and quanti uh, quantitative values. Okay, this is new late breaking uh, research that I'm going to present. Uh, you, you are probably the first to, to get uh, this, this study presented to you in the world, actually. Um, but we'll get back to that in a second. So if we're looking at what am I talking about, these multiple risks, we're talking about kids less than five who's a household contact or a child of any age from a hotspot community who is uh, in school, dialysis center. So we're talking about adding these risks together and prioritizing um, to, to reduce transmission and disease. Before I get to that, that groundbreaking study, I want to talk about adults, okay? And adult screening is very important. So which adult groups should we target to prevent disease and disease transmission in children, okay? Obviously, if you already have disease in the household, the other adults, guess what? They have a really high incidence of uh, disease too and infection. So I would say the adults and the adolescents in the household uh, are really putting those other kids at risk and their TB contacts. Uh, adults in congregate settings that expose children, okay? So who am I talking about? School teachers, healthcare workers, all of you, okay? Yeah, in your pediatrics uh, healthcare worker setting. And say, example, school bus drivers. Or, you know, it could be other workers as well that have a lot of interaction with children in a congregate setting. Uh, what about pregnant mothers? You know, it's an easy time to, to, to get them tested because they're going to see the doctor anyway. Um, you know, congenital TB does happen, and we are now finding out that pregnancy actually does affect the cell-mediated immunity of the mother, and it peaks right at delivery. And there are really good quantiferon and skin testing studies to show this although quantiferin performs better, even in HIV-positive uh, mothers in Africa. And then finally, the immunocompromised parents um, or, at, or household members, okay? So how could you accomplish this, this kind of screening? Um, I'm just giving you examples. Um, I, I'm dreaming here, okay? In the U.S., we actually do this. In San Francisco, if we found a child that was under five years old, that had a positive quantiferon or a skin test, guess what? We would investigate that household and we would have the, the, the parents uh, and the other siblings come in for testing and chest x-ray, okay? Uh, the other more important uh, um, action to take is really the development of uh, policy for school districts, um, infection control, uh, at the prevention provincial and national level. Uh, and that's what we have in the United States as an example. And our rates in TB of TB in our children are very, very low. Uh, it's, it's almost eliminated, okay, because we do so much prevention. And we're, you know, we're in a country that is very low burden. Our case rate, national case rate, is three cases per 100,000, okay. Um, so, and we monitor our children under five. Okay, now let's get to this groundbreaking study. Okay, and why is this groundbreaking? It's groundbreaking because it's filling a very important knowledge gap. Uh, I think it's a game changer, and it's a study from Stanford. This is from their press release. It's very hard to see, but basically it says, simple tests may predict which children develop severe TB. 
And this is a quantifiron study uh, that is being released in the Lancet, uh, I think today or tomorrow. Uh, according to this press release, was on the, that it was, it's online as of the 10th. And uh, I'm very fortunate to, to have this information from the investigator himself, Dr. Jason Andrews, who presented this data um, in Durban at the TV conference there uh, in July last year. And it's called Quantifiant Interferon Gamma Value at Conversion Predicts Risk of Progression. And he tried to answer these two questions, okay? Can routine quantifiant testing identify young children at risk of TB progression in a high-risk setting or high-transmission setting? And then the second, there are actually a third question, but just for the sake of time, I'm just doing two. Do the quantitative quantifiron values provide additional prognostic information? So the cohort uh, that they studied uh, was uh, the vaccination cohort in uh, South Africa. And unfortunately, the most promising candidate, MVA 85A, uh, it actually didn't work. But they, they, they learned a lot of information from this study. Okay, so it didn't impact the vaccinated cohort at all. It was a double-blind, randomized control. Um, so basically, they, they looked at 2,512 HIV-negative, quantifiron-negative infants uh, between the ages of four and six months, okay? They were enrolled into the study, and they were followed every three months for up to 37 months, okay? Their, their endpoints was looking for quantifiron conversion and disease, okay? So what did they find? Well, first of all, they found that there was no difference in the conversions between the vaccinated group and the placebo group. The conversion rate, or the new infection rate, was about 7% for both groups. Is 7% high? Yes, it's actually very, very high um, for, this is not a contact study, okay? This is just general healthy kid population. Okay. Um, there was no difference uh, in the quantifiant values between the converters, okay? You can see the values here, the quantitative values. This is the control, and this is the MVA85. Slightly lower, but when you look at the mean, there's absolutely no difference, okay? Um, there were more kids that were uh, negative at enrollment, but remember only 2,710 uh, 2, kids were enrolled in this particular study. At day 336, um, they, 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 that's when they measured for uh, conversion. They tested for conversion. So this is the results, okay? What they did is they looked at the standard cut point for quantifiron, which is 0.35, okay? These are the negatives here, okay? Uh, and they looked at the incidence of TB. The incidence of TB in the quantifiron negatives was less than 1%. 0.7, okay? And when you compare it to uh, the positives that were in between 0.35 and 4 international units per ml, the incidence rate per 100 uh, person years was 2.3. Now, when they increase that cut point to 4 and above, you see the incidence rate jump to 27.3%. Um, that's extremely high. So the number needed to treat is basically three patients to prevent one case. Now remember, we don't have a vaccine, okay? So the in increase uh, rate ratio is 39.5%, uh, which is really incredible. And this is in the, the case definition where you don't have confirmation with my, uh, microbiology. Uh, when they looked at culture or expert, they also saw a very different trend. These are all statistically significant. So one of the co-authors concluded um, why this study was so important is that we now know that the IGRA test can be used to identify those children who are at highest risk of developing tuberculosis disease um, and who would benefit most from uh, isoniazid treatment. Okay. So getting back to the whole screening process, this is the screening process. First, you assess the TB risk, and, you, and if there's no risk, then you stop. And then you do a test. If it's yes, uh, 
you do a TB test, it could be the IGRA or TST, uh, and you have to do a symptom review. Although children, you know, it's hard to, you almost never see symptoms. And accuracy matters. Why does it matter? Because if your answer is yes, your test is yes, then you have to do all this hard work here. You've got to get a chest X-ray, you have to evaluate the child, okay? Uh, and then you have to evaluate them for uh, preventive treatment. That's a lot of work, okay? And that's why having the right tool really matters. So what are our tools? We have the skin test, and now we have two interferon gamma release assays, T-spot, well, is an LE spot assay and quantiferon, which is an ELISA assay. And out of the two, the only one that can really be scaled up for countrywide use is quantiferon because T spot is too difficult uh, technically to do. So, how many of you in the room are using the skin test? Okay, mostly everybody. How many of you have used a quantiferon? Raise them real high. Okay, wow. Okay, so we have like maybe three to five people, okay. Uh, this is almost exactly the same response I had over 10 year, years ago when I gave a talk on quantiferon when I was TB controller in the United States. Today, when I ask the same question in the United States, it's just the opposite. The, the number of people using the skin test is now just a handful and the vast majority are using quantiferon, okay. So why? Uh, what's the problem with the skin test? This is the problem with the skin test. Uh, it was uh, discovered by Robert Koch, who discovered the bacilli over 100 years ago. And what is, what is a purified protein derivative? It's a mixture of denatured proteins, um, and it's created by autoclaving the actual organism 100 degrees for two hours, okay? And it's mostly proteins, 1% uh, nucleic acid, and a little bit of sugar. Okay, but this is the big problem. When you look at, this is MTB um, PPD and MAVM PPD, because you can do the same with the other mycobacteria, and MVOIS PPD, which is the basis of BCG, okay? So when you look at the overlap of proteins between these organisms, there's a lot of overlap. And so there's no surprise that you have false positives when you use a PPD from BCG as well as environmental mycobacteria. And I was told that the samples of water, this is way back when, maybe 10 years ago, uh, in Manila contain a lot of NTM, believe it or not. Um, so, you know, uh, people in, it's, it's not dangerous for you, it's just that you're exposed you're more likely to have false positive results. So you can see the overlap of protein there. Now, the, the limit of the interferon gamma release assays are exactly the same as the skin test. It cannot distinguish between active and latent TB, so it should never be used to rule out TB. It cannot distinguish between recent or old infection, and it should not be used to determine whether or not treatment works. So don't test your patient after you treat them. Because yeah, they can be negative, maybe a handful, 20 to 30% will be negative, but many of them will still be positive. And it's because it's the immune response, it's an immunoassay, okay? But what an uh, IGRA can do that the skin test cannot is that it cannot, it can distinguish between BCG and true infection. Now, many of you might have seen this uh, slide, and it's really hor horrible and busy, but I'm going to explain it to you, okay? The antigens used in an IGRA are highly specific. It comes from the region of difference one in the, on the genome of, of tuberculosis, ESAT6, CFP10, and TB7.7. They are contained in all of the uh, MTB complex organisms, tuberculosis, M. africanum, and M. bovis, the disease and bovis. However, they're all absent in every BCG substrain. It, it doesn't exist in BCG, and that's why you can tell the difference. Now, in terms of environmental mycobacteria, you can see there are only three that have ESAT6 and CFP10. This is M. kinsasii, Marinum, and Solgai. These are very rare, okay? The more common ones are M. avium, Shaloni, um, 
uh, Fortuitum, Gordoni, okay? Uh, and, and so what is really important is that IGRAs do not react to BCG and most NTMs. And that's why it's so much more accurate. And when you compare them side by side, okay, one's a blood test, one's a skin test, you're injecting things into the child, and many parents don't like that. Okay, that's, that's why they're rejecting vaccines, which is crazy, but believe it or not, that happens. Um, you're using single, highly specific antigens, and with the skin test, it's a gamush of hundreds of proteins. Um, with uh, IGRA and quantiferon, it can be fully automated, so really minimal uh, human, human error, whereas with the skin test, we all know that it's, it's red, placed wrong, read wrong, stored wrong, um, and, and that's why we were so anxious to get rid of the test in San Francisco. Um, the IGRA is not affected by BCG, as I mentioned, but we know with the skin test, it's not May, actually. It's absolutely the BCG effects results, and I'm going to show you that data. With an IGRA, you can get a result with one patient visit, and that's a big deal. This is the patient-centered test, right? It's a blood test. Whereas with the skin test, you have to return. And so guess what? Patients don't return because parents are too busy. Uh, they don't prioritize their health. There are many, many reasons, right? And, and so with uh, quantiferon, actually, there's no inter-reader variability because everything is read by a machine, the optical density reader, ex et cetera. But with the skin test, of course, there are many studies to show high inter-reader variability. The other really important aspect from a TB control program or for a provider's perspective is that the lab gives you the result electronically and it goes, um, it goes into the electronic medical record. And I know that there are many hospitals here that are so advanced and this is happening all over the world and you probably are already using EMR. Uh, whereas with the skin test, it's the result is hidden in, in usually the notes. It's, it's not systematically collected. Uh, with an IGRA, the results are actually confidential, whereas with the skin test, everybody can see the result. That's the other thing. And in the Philippines, in children, it's about 25% uh, positive. And then finally, with an IGRA, if you're just using an IGRA alone, there is no boosting of the result. But with the skin test, the more skin tests do you do, the more and more it can boost and uh, it can be very uncomfortable for the patient and also be interpreted as false conversion. Now in the U.S., the U.S. being the country that has, is the most experienced in using IGRAs now, um, they have uh, had this recommendation that IGRA is preferred in testing persons who are BCG positive uh, or BCG uh, vaccinated um, and or not coming back or unlikely to come back for their skin test reading. This has been in place since 2005. This is the updated version 210. However, it also states that the skin test is preferred in children under five, okay? So that represents a conflict, right? Because children under five that are BCG vaccinated are even closer to their BCG and much more likely to give you a false positive result. So that, there's that conflict. Now, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the Red Book, I, I know many of you are familiar with that, uh, it, it's really changed. In 2009, they were very conserved. They said IGRAs might be useful in children with BCG, but they can't recommend it for children under five. So it's like, no, no, no IGRAs for children under five. However, since 2012, it's really evolved. And now, today, it's really looking like the adult guidelines. So IGRA is preferred in children over five if they're BCG vaccinated or unlikely to return. And for children under five, it's also acceptable, although the skin test is still preferred because of the paucity of data. Okay, so it's, all, it's not because it didn't work well, it's just that there wasn't enough data or evidence, okay? So it's, it's changing, and I can tell you with this study, that breakthrough study I just showed you, it's likely to, um, to, to change to all ages. And the U.S. just in December has expanded their IGRA preference to all, uh, all individuals needing screening uh, with low and middle risk, uh, intermediate risk, um, not just BCG, but all foreign-born. 
uh, and, and anyone needing testing. So they've removed it, re it's expanded to beyond BCG. So there was a really nice technical report that I think all of you who are interested in using egress should read um, as a basis, but remember that there are lots of data that I'm going to show you today since this review uh, that led to that 2015 guidelines. And it's the technical report of the AAP. Uh, in that report, it says that when testing LTBI, some experts, many experts in fact, would use an IGRA in children two to four years of age, especially if they receive BCG. And it's, there's a similar statement in the 2015 Red Book as well. Okay, so let's get to the evidence now. Um, and, and if we're going to replace the skin tests, we have questions, right, as uh, physicians, and pediatricians specifically want to make sure that in our most vulnerable children, and we're talking children under five, because over five there's enough evidence now, that there's high specificity uh, and sensitivity. Uh, sorry, this meant s sensitivity and specificity. Uh, and we asked the question, does it have better predictive value? I just showed you the study, so I won't have to go through that too much. Um, and can we rely on those negative results? Are they truly negative? We want to be able to trust the test. So the big question is, can quantifurin actually uh, achieve that standard? Um, and when you look at evidence, please note this evidence chart, because there is no gold standard for latent TB infection, right? We can't culture latent TB. And that's the big problem. So the lowest uh, level of evidence is comparing the results to the skin test because you don't know which result is correct in latent TB infection. And actually, when you look at these studies, especially BCG vaccinated, these are the positive children are very different from the uh, from TS among the TST and and quantifurin. The next highest is looking at sensitivity and specificity in active culture-proven TB, which is also difficult in children. Why? Because you, you can't culture TB out of children most of the time, right? And then, then you go to a higher level of evidence, the correlation to exposure, but this predictive value for active TB, that's probably the highest form of evidence that we're ever going to get in children. Uh, and that's the study I just showed you by uh, Jason Andrews. And then the, but the highest level of of evidence is actually getting these, these infected individuals, treating them one group and not treating the other group, and seeing which group has less TB. Now there are studies in adults like that, but there are no studies in children, and we probably can't because of the ethical concerns. So let's, let's go through the performance. Now this is a new study by the Italians, and the Italians uh, have been using quantifuron in kids for over a decade, so they're real experts in it. And this is a multi-center study uh, in children less than uh, two, uh, three years old, so the first two years of life, okay? They had 823 um, children in this cohort. Um, half of them were males. Most of them were just a little over a year old. And um, when they look at sensitivity in active TB, okay, it was 92.4%. This is based on clinical diagnosis, standard clinical diagnosis, and microbiology as well. The specificity in latent TB infection in children with no risk of infection was 98.6%, okay? Um, and the indeterminate rate was 4.2%. It wasn't related to age or gender. Um, and ultimately, 91.4% uh, were uninfected. Now, when they took the kids that had both tests, uh, QFT and skin tests, and they compared them head to head, they had 616 kids, and you can see that the sensitivity of quantifurin was higher than the skin test, um, but the specificity here was the same, okay, about 98%. Um, and in it Italy, uh, they probably had less, uh, and, and the disparity was due to BCG. Um, but their conclusion was that quantifurin performed very well in children under three years old, and there was a low rate of indeterminate results. Okay, now this is the biggest one for you, okay? Um, we, used to, we used to tell uh, our, our parents and patients that, oh, you know what, 
uh, ignore the BCG because BCG has a minimal impact on the skin test. This is what the CDC made us do, okay? Now we know it is not true at all, okay? When they do these meta-analysis, this is the only meta-analysis that actually looked at BCG status. Uh, the specificity of BCG, uh, BCG vaccinated individuals, the IGRAs, was, uh, sorry, in the skin test was 59%. For IGRAs, it was 97%, okay, um, uh, in non-BCG vaccinated. So what does this mean? That means if you're BCG vaccinated and you have a positive test, 41% of the time that positive test is falsely positive. So that's like flipping a coin, yeah, okay? And that's why the skin test isn't so great. But what about in kids? This is a really important study for you because this was done by the US CDC. It's an uh, immigration study. So the children were uh, between the ages of two and 14 were screened using skin tests and quantifuron in three countries, in Mexico, Vietnam, and the Philippines. Uh, actually, most of the kids came from the Philippines, 2,520 children in total. When they looked at the skin test results, a quarter of them, 26%, were positive, okay, by the skin test, uh, and 74 were, were negative. When they, did, when they looked at the quantifuron results, 83% of these positives were negative, 83%. Okay, so if you believe the quantifuron, it, that's the false positive rate. Um, there were also uh, the double positives, but that was only 17%. Out of the negatives, 98% concordance with quantifuron negatives, and there were also 2% that were quantifuron positive skin test negative. Uh, but another thing I'd like to point out is the indeterminate rate. These are healthy kids. Uh, it was 0.5%, less than 1% in this cohort. Now, if we pull the countries apart, they had a different reduction of LTBI if you use the quantifuron result. In Mexico, it's 41% reduction. Philippines, 85% reduction in LTBI diagnosis using quantifuron. You can see this is the skin test result going up with age, and here's the quantifuron result. By the age of 14, it's about 50% positive by the skin test in the Philippines, okay? So this is a very important study for you. And, and this is what we see in our children in San Francisco. All of our children are, are pretty much Asian from China, Philippines, and Vietnam. And when we broke down our kids that had uh, both skin tests and quantifuron, uh, the discordant rates for children under five was 91%. Okay, so 91% false positives. So, you know, and if you're older, then it's less, 72%. So remember, being closer to your BCG, you are likely to get more false positives. In San Francisco, we actually showed that. We also found discordance in our U.S. born that did not have BCG vaccination, and we didn't know what to say about it. Uh, we had an opposite trend, and we think it's non-tuberculous mycobacteria colonization. Okay, or wrong readings, either one, okay. So, let, you know, let's look at the predictive value um, now. We, I already showed you the Stanford study that showed very high prediction based on the quantitative values. Um, there are two other studies in adolescent, uh, South African adolescents um, by Machingize and Andrews showing that if you convert your quantifuron, your, um, your risk of progression was eightfold higher than those who did not convert, who had a stable result. Um, in, in children in Germany, there were 106 kids, around 10 years old average, 36% were BCG vaccinated, and out of the 106, six progressed to active TB. Now, if we look at them by quantifuron results, six out of the 21 were quantifuron positive, giving it a 29% uh, progression risk, very similar to actually the South African study. Uh, however, when they looked at the quantitative values, okay, here's the quantitative value, and this is the skin test reading. You, you see the circled spots here? Those are the ones who actually went on to develop disease. So they had very high quantitative values. So this is anecdotal evidence of the uh, Stanford, the Andrews study. 
Okay, what's really important to me in this study? None of the 83 quantifying negative children developed TB. Okay, how did it compare to uh, five millimeters skin test reading? Well, you had have to uh, evaluate double the number of a skin test positive compared to quantifying 40 versus 21 to find the same number of cases. So if you're going to do contact investigation in kids, you want to use five millimeters, but you have, you have to expect to at least double the number of contacts you have to evaluate. So not very efficient. Uh, and if you use 10 millimeters, you would have missed kids because the threshold is too high, okay? Uh, so there's another study from South Africa. I'm just going to point out one thing from this study. Um, this also included HIV infected kids, 22%, 18% with exposure. Uh, you can see the positive rates were about the same as the skin test, 40% versus 41% for quantifiron. The, the test conversion was higher for the skin test, 11% versus 9%. Uh, and there was also test reversion of the skin test that was higher than quantifiron, uh, 15% versus 8%. So, meaning they converted and they were retested later and then they reverted to negative. The sensitivity uh, of, of detecting the cases within three months, uh, there were 8% of the contacts that developed TB within three months. Uh, you can see that quantifiron was better than TST or T spot, 79% uh, detected versus 75 versus or, or 71. Not perfect like the Andrews study, but remember this is HIV infected children and you can't expect them to have perfect immune systems, right, uh, in, in, in reacting to your tests. Okay, so let's look at the reliability of the negative results as, as, as a last thing. So I'd like to say this in a different way. Uh, is the quantifying assay adequately sensitive or can you trust that negative result in your highest risk groups? So this is our own experience in San Francisco uh, following a thousand children, a thousand ninety two children. You can see all of these children were high risk. They were all foreign born or they were contacts. Uh, we had almost 300 kids that were under the age of five and uh, the average follow-up was about 5.6 years for a total of over 5,500 person years of follow-up. Uh, we had 906 quantifying negative children that never got any chemoprophylaxis. Many of them had positive skin tests and none of them developed active TB, including those children uh, that were under five. And we would have expected to see, see some development there. Uh, there's experience from Japan in contact investigation in 16-year-olds where they use a skin test uh, in, in uh, 349 contacts, finding 27% were positive by the skin test. Now, you, you guys use Japanese BCG, right? I think. Well, uh, it's very potent. Look, 27% uh, in 16-year-olds were, were positive. Uh, when they tested with quantifiron, 84 out of 88, okay, uh, were negative by quantifiron. Uh, seven declined the test. What, but when they looked at the, all the, the 91 uh, skin test positive contacts that were not treated, none of them developed active TB, okay? Um, uh, and uh, out of, out of the, th the four quantifiron positives, it was noted that they had really close contact to the index case. It was a teacher in a high school, right? Um, but there was no difference in the closeness with the skin test results. Uh, in, in a grade school, a primary, it's a primary school teacher now that exposed, a really contagious teacher exposing 306 students, average age of eight years old, okay? Look at this, closer to the BCG, eight years old, 65% were positive by skin tests using a five millimeter cut point. It's not very specific, okay? But only 9.8% were positive by quantifiron, okay? Uh, they followed the kids for three years, and none of them developed active TB, the negatives. Okay, this is the ger German study. I already told you that out of the 83 quantifiron negatives, uh, of the children, 
uh, no one developed active TB. So can you trust that negative? Uh, and, and, and I'm including the Andrews study where it was 99% negative predictive value in ba basically infants, okay? Um, so yes, you can. This is the Andrews study. Yes, you can trust uh, quantifiron results that are the standard uh, less than 0.35, okay? So with two years of follow-up. So I'm getting very close to the end of my talk, um, but these are the treatments for latent TB infection, and what you have been using is isoniazid for six to nine months. Is it six months or nine months? Six, okay. I think six months is adequate, but in, in the U.S. They, they extended it to nine, <laughs> so it's even harder for us. Um, but this is the great hope for all TB programs across the world. This is the isoniazid rifapentine study. It's right now, it's still recommended as directly observed therapy, but you can, you can give it with your DOT for the adult in the household. Um, but it's 12 doses once a week, right? And so 12 doses is three months. So you're over with treatment three months. The efficacy is fantastic. There's less hepatitis in, you know, the older cohorts. In children, you never have to worry about hepatitis, although I've seen it. Um, and some hypersensitivity rash, um, but it, the, the completion rates are so good, and programs in the United States are just uh, so excited about this short course regimen. And that is the future, I hope, in, in the Philippines with the new TB law, the comprehensive TB elimination law. Uh, but wait, there's still more. It's like the Ginzu knife. Uh, um, we have a, a new quantifiron uh, that's already being used around the world uh, and coming very soon to the Philippines. Probably, we hope, by the end of the year. It's called quantifiron gold plus or QFT plus for short, just like the iPhone, yeah? iPhone 6 plus. Okay, it's the it's the latest evolution of quantifiron. The good thing is it's the same procedure. Okay, it's easy to do in the lab. It's a simple ELISA and the same technology as quantifiron. What's the plus? Okay, well, the plus is that in the registration trials, the sensitivity in active culture-proven TB was over 95%. I mean, it's, it's really incredible. Not in children, and these are all adults. Uh, but still, that's, that's much higher than what we had with the, the current quantifiron, and the same specificity of close to 99%. Um, but what's added, what's that plus, is another tube that actually contains CD8 antigens. This is the first assay to contain CD8 antigens. The antigens I talked about actually stimulate CD4 cells. So guess how it works in HIV? not as well as we'd like. It's better than the skin test, but it's still, we wanted an assay that would be more sensitive in HIV, immunocompromised, and young children. Uh, that's still yet to be proven. Uh, and then they, they really did improve the manufacturing process and uh, change the formulation uh, in the assay to make it more stable. Uh, you can also draw the blood into a single tube and send it to the lab. At the lab, they will have to put it into the four tubes where you have the two antigen tubes. Okay, so why, uh, why did we add the CD8 antigens? This is the plus to quantifiron plus. That's because CD8 um, T cells play a very important role in TB immunity. And when you talk to TB immunologists that are pediatricians, they say that CD8 T cells work great in children and, and young children. Um, so what do they do? Uh, CD8 cells actually suppress the MTB growth directly by interacting with infected cells. They can lyse those cells directly or program them to die, okay? So CD8 cells, uh, if you have the right CD8 antigens, are biomarkers, and that signal is a biomarker for intracellular TB burden. And so it shouldn't always be there. And when they look at the studies showing CD8 activity, where do you find CD8 activity? You find them more frequently in those with active TB versus latent TB, those who are newly infected from recent exposure. And um, uh, also, you, you would expect to see higher uh, responses in HIV in young children, and it has been. Um, and this is not yet with a quantifiron assay, but this is just all flow cytometry. 
uh, assays. And you should be able to also see a decline uh, in patients who are on treatment. The CD8 response should decline all the way, right? Because if you have too much CD8 response, guess what you get? You get autoimmune disease, okay? Uh, and that's not good. Uh, so uh, there are now seven independent studies showing all of these things. Uh, it, it shows uh, that it decreases with treatment monitoring at, at, in treatment, effective treatment, uh, but that's a small study. Uh, you see a, a, a large CD8 signal in active TB. 15% of contacts have the CD8 signal. Uh, so you can look forward to this assay uh, because it may also predict active TB along with quantitative values. So it's an improvement. Um, and so I'd like to just summarize by saying that the performance so far at Quantifuran is equal to better um, in active TB uh, compared to the skin tests um, in all ages, not just children over five, okay? Clearly it has better specificity than the skin test in BCG vaccinated populations. So this has wide implications for all of Asia. Um, and in Japan, they're using IGRIS only. In Korea, Singapore, Taiwan, they're using IGRIS almost exclusively. Um, the risk of progression uh, studies in children under five, that was always a gap, but we now have them with this, this breakthrough study um, in the Lancet. And it's a highly sensitive assay, if you, you know, 99%. Uh, so you're not going to miss any cases, right? And the negative predictive value is really, really outstanding. Uh, and within, within the United States, there is a move to accept IGRA testing in all age groups, and I believe it will be happening in the next two years or so. So with that, I'd like to really thank you, Salamat, for your attention. And um, I don't think we have time for questions, but if, if we have a break and you have questions for me, please, please find me during the break. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. El Mose. May we invite you to the 